Okay. Um, you can see in your bulletin, um, if you didn't grab one, you can get one by the door. There's some announcements, uh, with just a few mentions. We have the talent show for FLCS coming up, which will be on Facebook Live on April 16th. So not too long from now. Um, May 12th will be Honors Council for Kids Club, which is just hard to believe we're already that. No? Honor Council has been canceled. Ignore. Okay, there will be in-room parties, but the important practical part for all you parents with that also is on May 12th, that will be the last day of Kids Club. Okay, so after that, um, we'll just be having our Wednesday night studies. All right, uh, we're also looking towards June 12th as the next food giveaway. More, more announcements will be coming about those things in the near future as well. Uh, and any other... Any other announcements? No? Okay. Today's reading is in Acts chapter 2. It will be verses 22 through 28. As you turn there, I did remember one thing I wanted to add on to that with Kids Club. Youth group ages 7 through 12 does not end with honor council. That will keep going. Um, we usually keep that going right through until I think graduation. So right towards the end of June. So if you have a child between seventh and 12th grade, they can keep coming for youth group. All right, Acts chapter two, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Lord, the resurrection. What a wonderful thing you've done for us, Lord, and that we enter into that resurrection as well. What a great hope we have. And, and Lord, who would have thought to, that you would do this for us other than you told us it would be done? So, Lord, we rejoice. We, we take such comfort knowing you have power over death, knowing that we are no longer bound by death, but you have given us life through your Son. So, Lord, today, in light of that, may we be quick to praise you. May we know the joy of our salvation. And, Lord, as, you, as we give our tithes and offerings here, Lord, again, we ask, as we often do, that they would be used to great effect for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we uh, ask that you would be amongst us this morning, Lord. We know that you are for us, and we know that because of that, nothing else can be against us, Lord. We praise you for that, for the work you did on the cross, Lord, and the great celebration we had last week, Lord. But let that be every week, Lord, that we would praise you for your power and for what you overcame, Lord, on the cross and by rising again, overcoming death, Lord. So we, we give you this worship this morning in your name. Amen. Yeah, would you stand and uh, worship with us this morning? I can see what is reaching at my feet. I can feel the breath of the surrounding me. I can hear sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down the stark and faithful road. I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to rave, is in us, is in us. The same power that can come a raging sea is in us, is in us, he lives in us, he lives in us. We have hope that his promises are true and strength. 
There is nothing we can do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake. There's enough. There's enough. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can come a raging sea. There's enough. There's enough. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. Grace my fears Relieve How precious Did That grace Appear The hour I first Believed My chains Are gone Ransom me. 
and we are yours, Lord. We know that not one will leave your hand, Father. So we praise you for that this morning, for the grace that you show us every morning, Lord, the mercy you give us, Father, that we don't deserve. Lord, we uh, praise you for who you are and what you've done, Lord, already, and what you're continuing to do, how you continue to work through us, Lord, and in us. We ask you to do that this morning as your word goes forth, that it would penetrate our hearts, Lord, that it would cut out all that's not of you, Lord, and uh, leave only only your son, Lord. Mm -hmm. We ask this now in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Greet someone. Wave over to someone or talk to someone. Let them know that you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. How you doing? Praise God. Everybody get a lot done yesterday in that beautiful sunshine and day? What a great day God gave us yesterday to get things done. Before we start, I just want to make an announcement um, to the men. We have a men's day down in Elmira. Uh, how many of you went two years ago with us down to Elmira? And uh, Pastor Fred White down in Elmira is going to host an all-day uh, men's day uh, from 8 to 3. We'll take the van for those that sign up early, and we'll head down. So next week, we will not have a breakfast. So no breakfast next week. Uh, this will be on, uh, you know, two weeks from yesterday, the 24th. Sorry about the short notice. I got it a little later than... I was supposed to because I think they sent it to the wrong email address. Probably my fault, especially if it's something to do with email. But I've got the um, posters on the bulletin boards in the foyer here and also down on the other end of the hall. If you have your Bibles this morning with you, let's open to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Last week, we on Resurrection Sunday, we looked at the account of the resurrection in Matthew's Gospel, principally the first 12 verses in chapter 28. Uh, this particularly is one of my favorite accounts. I, I think I, I really appreciate and really love Luke's account. It's a little bit longer, and it has this wonderful, I was going to say story, this wonderful event, historical event, of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And so we're going to look at this this morning. And I want to just preface this by saying that Jesus said to us in the Gospels, 
you will never ever see me do anything that I do not presently, right this moment, see my Father doing in heaven. And you will never ever see, hear me say one word that I do not, right this moment, presently, hear my Father speaking in heaven. You know, the implications of that are very broad, but for this particular vignette, with these two guys on the road to Emmaus, it just kind of came to my mind, guess who else is on that road? Yes, Jesus was walking with those two disciples, but God was there too, because you see, Jesus wouldn't have been doing that if God weren't doing that in heaven. And, and I think we should take the Bible much more literally than we do. You know, sometimes people will say to you as an unbeliever, well, don't tell me you guys take the Bible literally. And your answer to that should be this. No, no, we take it seriously. See, because the problem with many naysayers, with many so-called, even though there is no such thing, atheists, with those who don't believe, is they've really never checked out the facts in many cases. And many who have checked out the facts have been converted. Some very famous people in the body of Christ who got saved because they checked it out to try to prove that you can't trust the Bible, or to try to prove that there was no God that came to earth and then raised from the dead. Pastor Nick read a very interesting passage of Scripture in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm just going to point out to you that in the first three verses of what he read, 22, 23, and 24, we find the gospel in a nutshell. Basically, verse 22 talks about his life. Verse 23 talks about his death. And verse 24 talks about his resurrection, coming up from the grave, uh, making it possible that death would be abolished. 2 Timothy 1.10. He abolished death. And so as we read this, keep in mind that Jesus is right where his Father is because his Father in heaven would be walking with these two men and Jesus was walking with them. Starting in verse 13 in Luke 24. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned, by the way, underline that word, very good thing to do, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said, that is, Jesus said to them, what things? Doesn't Jesus have an incredible sense of humor? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today's the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, by the way, that's not a compliment, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart, underline that word, it's singular, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us? on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon Peter. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Would you pray with me? Father, this is a fascinating section, an interesting situation, and Lord, it's all related to these this morning and day after your raising from the dead. Lord, we want to be sure that we are hearing from you this morning. Not from Pastor Ray, not from Calvary Chapel, but from your word. Your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Do, do your work through your word this morning and give us that know you the understanding. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, they're all kind of believing in all different stages, aren't they? You know, we learned last week that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, which is unusual of itself in that day, in that age, in that culture. And then he, of course, showed himself to the other women that had been, many of them, at the cross and then also at the tomb when Joseph and Nicodemus had anointed the body with the hundred pounds of uh, spices. And we see that the men didn't believe. They didn't believe Mary. Then the women came. They didn't believe the women. And then the guys didn't believe Peter and John. So we got a lot of unbelief going on here. And that's not very unusual. Um, we see that all the time today. You know, anyone can come at any time that they choose to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's just like people today. It was just like then, just like it was back then. It is like it is today. Je um, Jesus says in John chapter 3, when he's talking about what it means to be born of God's Spirit, and he says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That is the capital S, Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's where we get that terminology from this passage, that you must be born again to even see, let alone enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's very important that people would understand that. But I want you to understand this. At this stage of what's going on, remember the church is not born yet. Pentecost hasn't taken place. We're about to go through that 40-day period before Pentecost. We're about to go through that 40-day period that Acts chapter 1 talks about he gave many convincing proofs. In other words, he was God. So if he was going to give convincing proofs, they'd be very convincing. And we read about many of them. And we have one here where after he breaks the bread, it says he just vanished. 
I, I, I'd like the video, please. I mean, what, what, do you, what do you mean he vanished? Well, just like in Acts when the uh, uh, Philip was baptized, he got saved, he was baptized, and all of a uh, I'm sorry, the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, and Philip just disappears. He goes 18 miles away to Azotaz for my next magical trick, you know. See, you and I aren't surprised by these things. We, we are amazed by them, but we're not surprised because we believe there's nothing that he can't do. Is there anything too difficult for me, saith the Lord? But we look at this road to Emmaus. It's a fascinating passage. Um, their eyes got opened, but it took some doing. It took a little while. It says they were in that same day traveling to the village of Emmaus, and verse 14, they talked together of all the things which happened, so it was while they conversed and reasoned. God has always asked us to reason. Whether it's the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 1, Jay's favorite verse, come now, let us reason together. The whole nation of Israel is in total disobedience. They're in idolatry. They're a mess. They're, they're sore from the head to the foot, it says. And Jesus, oh God, makes the appeal. Come. Come talk to me about this. Let's reason together because your faith is very reasonable. Don't ever let anybody say to you, oh, you Christians with your blind faith. There is nothing blind about Christian faith. We have more evidence. Other religions, and Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. All the other religions, they don't have any proof. And yet we constantly allow that barrage of, oh, you Christians with your blind faith. No, no, we're not blind. We're coming into it wide open, eyes wide open. And by the way, you should tell people that if you're going to lead them to the Lord. You need to come in with your eyes wide open. You need to know what you believe. God does not ask anyone to check their brains at the door before they become a Christian. It's not some cult where we have some you know, persuasive power other than the Holy Spirit that, that, that guides us and, and, and moves us along. And he says, come, let us reason together, say the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. They are red like crimson, they shall be made white like wool. It didn't begin there. God expected Adam and Eve, God expected Cain and Abel to reason. He says to Cain, Cain, why are you so angry? And why has your countenance fallen? You know, people get angry at God. We get a beautiful day like yesterday, and they're just shaking their fist at God. God is so unfair. Look what he's done to me. You know, now I got, now I got this. They took my license away because I got a DWI. Yeah, but God didn't make you drink that alcohol. God didn't make you sleep with that girl or that guy. God didn't make you, you know, go gambling and 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 let all your savings get taken away but we blame God for everything he's just he's the scapegoat well if it weren't for God you know if it weren't for God you wouldn't have a breath in your lung <laughs> and so God's always saying this he's saying hey your faith this is a reasonable thing I'm asking why are you angry why is your countenance falling if you do well translation if you do what's right a five-year-old child knows what's right and wrong. In fact, I was talking about a, a one-year-old in the, in the high chair. And what do they do? Well, they spill the milk. And then some fool picks it up, puts it back on the high chair, and then they spill it again. And then someone picks it up, maybe another fool, and puts it back. And then they look at you like this, and they go. What's your first clue that you're a sinner? Your kid, just look at them. They're the cutest little sinners in the world. God made him cute so we wouldn't kill him. You know, isn't it true? We laugh, but my goodness. And Pastor Scott reminded me of something else. There's another side to that equation. He makes them cute so we won't kill them. He makes them little so they won't kill us. Because if you have a two-year-old, they would be dangerous <laughs> if they were big. 
It's like I heard Joe Foch say one time, you're going to do what I say because I weigh 180 pounds, huh, son. Now, you've got to come up with another strategy when they become teenagers. I understand all that. <laughs> I think we're getting off topic here. But they, they conversed and they reasoned. Listen, God has made life reasonable. He has made faith reasonable. I'm the one that's not reasonable. Why? Because I'm like that two-year-old kid in the high chair. I want what I want. And what I don't want to do, don't want to. Can't make me. And by the way, the hardest thing is sometimes God won't make you. See, God will not violate my will and make me believe. And so they're walking along the road here. They're reasoning that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. By the way, he goes with us too. In fact, the Bible says he goes before us. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now, it says in John chapter 20, verse 9, in the account of the resurrection there, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. We explained that last week, ek nekron, that we will rise out from among those that are dead who will stay in their graves when the church gets raised out. Jesus rose up from, out from among all the dead people that have died before he was born, and he came out from among them. That's what Christians will do. We'll actually come out from among all the rest of the dead who get judged a thousand years later when when uh, the great white throne judgment comes. One can know the, that Jesus rose from the dead, but unless you know his words, it won't make sense. Without knowing the life and teachings of Jesus, you don't know that the resurrection means that the payment that Jesus offered on the cross at Calvary was perfect and it was complete. You don't know that the cross was the payment and the empty tomb was the receipt. You don't know that death has no hold on redeemed man. Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, if you believe in me, though you were dead, this stuff, the physical part, the body, though your body is dead, yet shall you live forevermore. You don't know that death has no hold on redeemed man. You don't know that when God's love and man's hate battled on that cross, that God's love won. Who wins? We do, that have believed. We win because Jesus won first. And you don't know that because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can be resurrected in him. All these people that are getting saved along these stages didn't know those things until one moment their eyes were open. Many of you, I hope all of you, but most of you anyway, as I look around, there was a moment when it all came clear. Um, we were in Pastor Nick's office several years ago um, you can pray for the Searing family, uh, their Aunt Pat went home to be with the Lord. She got baptized here, and she's been quite ill for the last couple of years. And I'll never forget it, because it was my testimony as she gave it. I said, that was me. And she was in her at least late 50s, I'd say, and we baptized her. And she gave her testimony, and she said, everything I ever believed was wrong. That's when you know you're saved when you realize everything I ever believed. Now, that doesn't mean you can't know facts. It just means that everything I ever believed, I had it wrong. I had all the religion down, but I had the truth of the gospel I didn't know at all. And I didn't know any of those things. But the moment a person gives their heart to Jesus, those things are crystal clear. The burden not only gets rolled away, the, the light comes shining and rushing in to the heart, and they realize. And that's, that's what this is going to talk about here in Luke 24. And he said to them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now, something or someone was restraining their eyes. Well, I think it was Jesus. 
Why? Because Jesus has this wonderful habit, even today, of drawing faith from a person by asking questions. He did it all over the place. He did it with the woman at Nain. He did it with the woman at the well, the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. He did it with the guy with the withered hand. You know, stretch forth your hand. What if the guy stretched forth the good one? You ever stop and think about it? He had to have enough faith to take that withered hand and stretch that one forth. And he probably had to hold his hand up with his good hand and stretch it out in front of everyone in the synagogue. And I think Jesus did that on purpose because everyone Jesus calls, he called publicly. Their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. God always has a purpose in anything he's going to do. And he said to them, verse 17, what kind of conversation is this you're having with one another as you walk and are sad? Or maybe a little angry. Certainly disappointed. Depressed, maybe. Fearful. Certainly, if you're not saved and you're not afraid to die, something wrong with you. Because we're going to be, wherever we go after this life, we're going to be there a whole lot longer than we're here. An eternity longer. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger? Now, here's amazing. Jesus is going to let them just go through this whole litany of what happened. You know, he could have interrupted and said, wait, 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 I'm God. Let me just explain what happened here. But he didn't do that, and he doesn't do that with us. He gives us that freedom, that liberty to think through. He wants us, he says, count the cost. This could have been part of the process for these guys. I don't know. You know, these weren't the apostles. These were just disciples. That we only know Cleopas because it's in the scripture. These weren't the famous guys, the, 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 you know, the 12. These were just two disciples. I shouldn't say just because they were disciples. And, and God loved them as much as any other. And he lets them go through this whole thing. Look what he says. Are you the only stranger? Now here they are rebuking the Messiah who just came off the, you know, came back from heaven and he he just paid the ultimate price the sacrifice for the sins of the world and they start telling him are you the only stranger in jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened there in these days and he said to them what things <laughs> so they said to him the things concerning jesus of nazareth you know what are you crazy who are you what planet did you come from you know, they say it's only seven miles from Jerusalem. It wasn't like it was on the other side of the world. Where have you been? Someone drop you out of a, you know, hot air balloon or something? I don't even think they had them at that point. But uh, that must have been the Holy Spirit. Um, and they, they say, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, mighty indeed. And, and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. You know, they're probably thinking, I cannot believe they did that. And yet the crowds all were hollering, hollering, crucify him. But of course, those that believed, they weren't hollering that. And it says, mighty indeed and word before God with all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. He's silent through this whole thing. And the di disciples just went on and on telling him. Now, look, is Jesus playing head games with these guys? I don't think so. It's a setup. He's doing this on purpose. God's enticing them. God's inviting them. In fact, he's inviting all to come. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the same shall be saved. Whosoever. There's a group called the whosoever's. A group of teenagers got together and just, they have a whole ministry. You know, whosoever will come. And they go out on the streets and talk to these kids. You know what? God's always been saying that. Turn to John chapter 1. Just a couple of pages to the right. 
When Jesus first came on the scene, you remember John the Baptist said, Behold, verse 29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look down to verse 36. Looking at Jesus as, the, as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him, John and James, and uh, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them what? What do you seek? See, that's what Jesus was doing here. In another form or way, he said, what do you guys want? What are you seeking? Are you interested? Do you really want to know? You know, some people don't want to know. I've shared the gospel with people, and they, no, I'm not interested in that. Give them a track, you know. <laughs> poor, poor Danielle, when she was about three or four years old, we were walking down the mall. She gave a track to someone, and she came back to me crying. And I said, what's the matter, honey? She said, the guy wouldn't take the, the track from me. I said, well, you know, some people just don't want God. Hard thing to have to tell you, a three- or four-year-old, but that's really the bottom line. And what are you supposed to do? Jam the track in the guy's lunchbox or something? You know, that, that's not how Jesus operates. He will not violate our will. He, he, and so it says, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus said, what seek ye? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. Would you notice the next line? Everyone, let's read it out loud. Come and see. And they said, and it says what next? They came and saw. Wow, that's called obedience. If the creator of the universe tells you to come and see, you need to go and see. Come and see. And they saw. So that's what's going on in essence here in our story, I believe. Sorry, Hank. And they, they were trying to see what was going on. And they get done doing that part of the story. And it says, but we were hoping. They were hoping. What does the Bible say about faith? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things what? Not seen. Um, Peter says this in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. He says, and I love this because, now maybe some of you, I know Bob Brostek has, but I don't know anyone else who's actually seen Jesus. Maybe someone here has. Uh, I'm not talking about a vision, actually seen Jesus. Okay. Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I'll never forget when I got saved. It's exactly what happened. I didn't need to see Jesus. He came right inside of me. And all the guilt of the stupid and foolish and sinful things I did was just rolled back as if it never happened. And then he spoke to me. And said, now you're never going to die, Ray. 29 years old. 29 years old. All my life. You can ask my wife. Kind of a chicken most of my life, you know. Didn't want to die. Used to ask my parents about it and everybody else. And the fact of the matter is, nobody wants to die. They're just not going to admit it. Well, I admitted it. And here we have, we, we have these guys they're, they're saying, uh, we're hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. And certain women of our company who had, uh, arrived at the tomb early astonished us. Now, now, I want you to note that. Underline that phrase. There are a lot of people I find in the Bible that are astonished that don't get saved. Just because someone's astonished doesn't mean they're saved. It just means they're astonished. Well, this is amazing. And these guys still don't believe yet. Who arrived at the tomb early, and these women astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels. 
what we're getting into here is witnesses, aren't we? Th these women were witnesses. Mary Magdalene would be the ultimate witness because he first appeared to her and she recognized him. They had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it. You see what they're, they're, they go, we got all these witnesses, but we can't believe. Or we won't believe. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Well, of course they didn't see him. He had risen. <laughs> How would they have seen him? He was gone. The tomb was empty. John and Peter ran up to the tomb. Peter looks in first. Actually, John got there first. He looked in. Peter came. He looked in and he saw. And John looked in and he perceived. When John looked in, he went, something's going on here that's pretty exciting. And that was the beginning of John being able to embrace uh, the, the truth. But they said they did not see him. Then Jesus, and of course, here's the focus of the whole message. Jesus turned to them and said, Oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? This was kind of Jesus' way of saying to these disciples, the same thing he used to say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the priests and the, the religious leaders. You guys ever read your Bible? You know, I find one of the biggest problems in Christianity today, in our nation at least, Christians don't read their Bibles. I think it's great if you have favorite teachers, David, Jeremiah, and, and the guys. We, got, we are loaded for bear with teaching. No one in America is going to be able to say to God, I never heard. What are you kidding me? You accidentally turned it on your radio. Everyone's heard. We've got great teachers. But God wants me to know him on an intimate, personal level. And in order to do that, I've got to read the Bible and I've got to eat for myself. Every Christian, sooner or later, has to eat for themselves. I understand when you first get saved, you don't know anything and you need a lot of teaching. But what you really need is to know him through his word the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth and he, he has given us the living word of god it's right in our lap it's in your glove compartment of your car it's on the back of the toilet it's it's all over your house every, every christian i know has more bibles than it's not it, that's like being astonished i'm astonished at how many bibles that i own <laughs> But that doesn't mean they're being read. And I say that not to rebuke. I say that as a reminder to myself. It's very easy for me to just pump out messages and not sit quietly and alone. You know, I really believe that when I look at this account, that's part of the problem we have in our nation, in our culture, isn't it? We don't have any time to sit still before God. I know because that happens to me. We got something coming up next week. We got this going on over there. And I wonder how to remedy that. And I, I don't always know. Listen, I'm getting old. Sometimes I just want to go over to my grandchildren, sit on the couch, tickle them, and read books to them, you know? And, and then I relax. And I got 20 of them, so I do a lot of tickling and a lot of reading. But the thing is, I need rest. What did Jesus say? Come unto me, all ye that are exhausted. Anyone exhausted? You don't have to be 70 to be exhausted, but you can be exhausted at 40. I've talked to a couple of you. Why am I so worn out? Well, maybe it's because I need to spend more time on the road to Emmaus. Maybe I need to sit down and hear from him. Maybe I just need to know his voice. Maybe I just need to quiet down a little. And for me personally, maybe I need to shut up and stop talking all the time and be like Johnny and listen. <laughs> He's a little eerie sometimes. He just listens too much, you know. Not really, Johnny, just kidding. No, it's true. 
Uh, oh, foolish one, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? I was going to take you through some of these passages, but instead I'll just say this. Just imagine. What would it be like to sit before Jesus and have him teach to you from some of these prophetic passages that we all know so well what would it be like if we could sit down and listen to jesus expound on isaiah 53 and 52 on the suffering servant how about daniel chapter 12 wouldn't that be a fascinating thing to listen to jesus take on what chapter 12 because a lot of people have a lot of controversy on chapter 12 and he would you wouldn't have to worry about it whatever jesus said would be right what if he what if you could sit in a bible study and jesus expounded on zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 and they looked upon the one whom they pierced they looked upon the one and that was him speaking to you wow Wouldn't that be exciting? Listen, he taught them that the Messiah was the seed of the woman, all the way back in Genesis. He taught them uh, whose heel was bruised. But he will crush his head. Paul writes in chapter 16 of Romans, he says, very soon Satan will be crushed under your feet. Your meaning us, our feet. The blessing of Abraham to all the nations in chapter 12. What if Jesus was teaching you that Bible study? I I bet everyone would pay attention. The high priest after the order of Melchizedek later on in Genesis. The man who wrestled with Jacob. The angel of the Lord. Put his socket right out of joint. Best thing that ever could have happened to Jacob. Because Jacob needed to be governed by God I need to be governed by God the lion of the tribe of Judah he taught them about the voice from the burning bush there in Exodus chapter 3 verse 12 or 14 the he taught about the Passover lamb no doubt Exodus the prophet greater than Moses where was that anybody Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 15 18 another prophet like Myself will come. And if you don't listen to him, there is no other stop. The captain of the Lord's army to Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. Don't you love that one? The, the, the angel of the Lord comes and he goes, whose side are you on? And the, and the angel of the Lord goes, neither. I'm the captain of the Lord of hosts. You know what side I'm on? I'm on the same side of the one that said to Pilate, anyone that hears my voice is on the side of truth. That's who I am. What if if Jesus gave us a Bible study on Ruth? Where is she? Right there, your favorite, right? On the ultimate kinsman redeemer mentioned in Ruth. How about the son of David who is a king greater than David? What if he taught 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, talking about a kingdom that would be forever? How about the suffering Savior of Psalm 22, the good shepherd of Psalm 23, the wisdom of Proverbs? That's who Jesus is, the wisdom of Proverbs, the lover of of the Song of Solomon, the Savior described in the prophets and the suffering of Isaiah, and the princely Messiah of Daniel who would establish a kingdom that would never end. What a Bible study. I'd like to get the tape if I could. Tape. That shows you how old I am. So he's, he's, he's rebuking them. And it says in verse 27, look at it. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That must have been a long afternoon. Because all the scriptures, without any exception, speak of him. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him. Underline that word. That's an interesting word. That word constrained 
It's the same word that's used when Jesus says, the kingdom of God suffereth violence. In other words, they didn't just say, oh, come on, stay for dinner. They were grabbing his skirt. They were, they were holding on to him. They were saying, don't go. We don't know who you are. They still don't know him yet. We don't know who you are, but we like you. <laughs> we feel good when we're with you. But Jesus wants us to have more than a good feeling, doesn't he? Jesus wants us to know him and the power of his resurrection and somehow share in the fellowship, here's our favorite part, of suffering that we would fill up in ourselves the suffering that was suffered on the cross, that we would die to our selfish desires as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a child. That, that, that's what I think he's after here. They constrained him saying, abide with us. Now, there was a cultural thing going on. You know, they, they had to give hospitality. That's a thing that still goes on there today. Even, even the uh, Arabs that live out in the desert, if your blood-sucking enemy comes in the door of your tent, you had to treat him with great respect, friendship, even if you hated him. It was part of their culture, very important to them. Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Verse 30, now it came to pass as he sat down at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Now, don't confuse this with the Last, with the last Supper. This has nothing to do with any kind of a religious, ceremonial, sacramental thing that went on in the upper room when Jesus was, was making the covenant with his heavenly bride, you and me. That's what was going on in the upper room at the Last Supper. The Passover would be the next day. What was going on when they broke the bread up in the upper, in the, um, you know, in the upper room was a marriage covenant. That's not what this is. This is some food that Jesus broke. They were out in the middle of nowhere, and he just said grace. He gave thanks. It came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then, verse 31, here it is. What an explosion. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him. What did Paul say? I want to know him now in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him after doing all the stuff, all the things, all the work. Now I just want to sit down and get to know him. And that's what he wants for me. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for every one of us. Then their eyes were open. And they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart, note singular, did not our heart, look, their heart wasn't burning because they believed he was risen. It doesn't say anything about the fact that they believed he was risen. Their heart was burning. Their heart was burning simply because of the ministry of God's word and Jesus who is the living word of God. That's why almost everyone in here, I'm sure, has experienced this. You sit alone with your Bible, and all of a sudden you're reading a passage you've read a hundred times. And all of a sudden you begin to weep or cry. You, you begin to realize, oh my goodness, I've read this verse all my life. But now God is applying it to a certain circumstance, a certain situation, a certain heart attitude. They didn't believe yet. They hadn't seen him yet. Jesus is going to come a couple of verses later and he's going to show up and scare him half to death. Because they thought they saw a ghost. And Jesus is going to have to say, guys, guys, calm down. Does a ghost have flesh? And what does he say? And bone? No blood. I find that fascinating. Do you, do you think a ghost has flesh and bone like you see here? Come and handle me. And then what I love about Jesus, he's so practical. He goes, you got anything to eat? <laughs> We're gonna have a, you're going to eat in heaven, no calories. You don't have to worry about your weight. You don't have to worry about your cholesterol. 
I really think Jesus did that to just show, hey guys, it's going to be pretty cool. You think pizza's good and wings, you know? I got stuff that you don't even know anything about, man. You, 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 I've got food that your taste buds have never known anything about, that they've never ever experienced before. I, I got color. I got things you're going to see that your eyes have never yet seen. Remember, we're going to get new bodies. We're going to get bodies likened unto his body. This is the body we get, flesh and bone. Interesting, no mention of blood. Didn't our heart burn with him, within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? See, it's the scriptures because he is the scripture. He is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. He opened the scriptures. Their eyes were open. They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen. Finally. But you see, all that preliminary stuff was necessary. I, I told you I got saved when I was 29 years old, but I heard the gospel when I was 27. And God kept putting these weird people in our way. And it was okay, but they were just a little strange. Lord, we don't mind you trying to speak to us, but we've got work to do. And, you know, I've got a business I'm trying to build, and I want to be self-sufficient so that my wife can raise the kids. You should probably already know that if you're really God. So, you know, but you see, the fact of the matter is, that all had to happen in those two guys' lives. And I'll tell you what, I believe firmly in all, with all of my heart that he has an individual plan for every single one of us. And he knows exactly what road your Emmaus is. And you're on it right now. You know, the Bible says, don't despise the day of small things. Don't despise the road that God has on you, you on right now. Because if you despise the road you're on right now, you're going to miss it. Because you can't be on a road that you haven't gotten to yet. You can only be on the road he's got you on right now. And that's what was happening with these guys. The Lord is risen indeed. We can do that today, can't we? The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. And this is all the evidence we need right here on this table. Not because of those fancy golden things either. Because of what his word tells us. And they, have, they told about the things that had happened on the road. There's their testimony. And it was a powerful one. And how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Not some religious, sacramental, traditional. There's nothing. I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, sacrilegious i'm just saying he was just breaking bread they were just having a meal might not have even been anything that tasty this certainly isn't very tasty it's the word and the ministry of the word and so we will have the guys come up and serve the bread let me just say a quick prayer father we know you have a road for us we're praying today, we're praying this morning that you would give us the faith to walk on that road that you have for us. Not the road you have for my wife, not the road you have for my child, not the road you have for my parents, but the road that you have, our own personal Emmaus. We pray that you would do that, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
died my soul to save thy lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left crimson stain he washed it white as snow Jesus paid it all paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as I kind of had a new devotional for this year. It's uh, Spurgeon's Morning by Morning with commentary by this guy, Jim Ryman. And I was looking at this this morning and it just, whoa, I said, th th we got to read this before we partake. He says, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. It's an interesting thing, almost phenomena, a phenomenon that we can rejoice and celebrate in his death. You see, the world could never understand that. You see, the world looks at the, you know, th this is a bloody religion. I, how could you believe that your God would die a horrible, and they don't even understand. They don't even understand that it's not just the physical suffering of the cross and the scourging and the crown of thorns. They don't even understand anything about, not that we can comprehend it, but they don't even know about the three hours and the suffering that he really suffered was the eternal suffering that he has spared you and me from. When Daniel saw his great vision he described his sensations in this way. 
I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Remember when Daniel was praying, fasted and prayed for three weeks. The angels were delayed because they had a little problem with the prince of Persia, a little bit of a battle going on in the heavenly realm. How much more weak and faint the greater prophet, Jesus, must have been when he saw the dreadful vision of the wrath of God that he spared you and me from. We will never, it will never come to our address. And then felt it being poured out on his own soul. The excruciating pain and suffering our Lord experienced would have overcome each of us. And the blessing of unconsciousness would have come to our rescue. But in his case, he was pierced. Isaiah 53. And felt the pain of the sword. And he drained the cup. That cup of indignation. That cup of wrath. He drained it to the bottom. Tasting every drop. And then this poem by George Herbert. O king of grief. A title strange, yet true to thee of all kings only do. O king of wounds, how shall I grieve for thee, who in grief gave thyself for me? Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took the bread. This was significant when he did this with the 12 disciples. And I want you to remember and to notice Judas was there. The one who dips the sop in my cup, that's the one who will betray me. It's almost unimaginable the forgiveness that God demonstrates on the cross. He said, this is my body. He doesn't say it's going to become my body. He says, do this. He broke it, just like he did on the story we just read. He broke it. He says, and do this as often as you do it. That means as much as you want in remembrance of me. Then the cup, and as I mentioned last week, I think it was last week, that the Last Supper was a marriage covenant. And in the Jewish traditions, the Orthodox Jews, the bride-to-be would either drink of the cup or reject the cup. That would be what determined whether she was saying yes or no to the proposal. I wasn't looking at my watch. I was looking at my goosebumps. And Jesus said, this is the cup of salvation that you guys are trading in for the cup of wrath. Psalm 116. I'll take the cup of salvation, the psalmist says. You and I have taken the cup of salvation. We experience life. He said, this is my blood in the new covenant shed for you. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. 
No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, and take us home from this place with a thankful.